All right. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Complete Guide to Return X. Uh, I'm Arthur O'Dwyer. Here's another title slide. And you'll notice that I also do C++ training. Uh, if you like what you see here, um, know that it's also available for uh, corporate training and, and things of that nature. Uh, send me an email. Um, all right, let us get started. I noticed I've got the wrong date on these slides already. All right, we're off to a good start. Um, so here we have uh, what we're going to talk about today, which is, uh, as the title slide said, uh, a complete guide to everything that might happen when you say return x. We're not even going to talk about return any other expression. We're just going to talk about return x. Uh, and I'm going to walk you through um, all of the stuff there is to know about return x, talk about what is the return slide, NRVO, various optimizations, and in particular, uh, an optimization from C++11 known as implicit move. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the ways that that has evolved from 11 uh, to C++20 and beyond. I've got a proposal right now before the committee. Um, I think it is likely to get adopted for 23, and we're going to talk about what changes it makes. Um, so this is a lot of slides. This is like almost uh, 80 slides in 90 minutes. We'll see if we can get through it. I do have a, um, copious question breaks in here. If you have questions, please put them uh, either in the Q&A or in the chat. Uh, and at the question breaks, I'll go look through the chat and, and see what there is. Please do ask questions. Um, all right. So here we go. I am a, an x86-64 chauvinist, so I, when I do assembly code, it's going to be x86-64. But there's not going to be that much of it in this talk after the first bit. Um, I here have a function f. f returns an integer. It returns int i. Uh, i is a stack variable initialized with 42. Over here we see we're putting 42 onto the stack. And then we're returning i from this function. When we return i in this particular calling convention, um, we put it into the return register, EAX. Um, that's one of the registers on the x86-64 architecture. Um, and it comes back to our caller in that register. Our caller then, after they do the, the call to f, um, they see uh, the result uh, 42 in EAX, uh, and then they can do whatever they want to it. So here we're adding one to it uh, and then returning. Um, so uh, since f and test each have their own stack frame, i and j are different variables, right? i is on the stack frame of f, j is in the stack frame of test. Uh, in fact, in the previous slide, I didn't even put it on the stack frame. I put it in a register. Um, and j gets initialized with a copy of i. Right? C++ loves copy semantics. When we pass things to functions, we make copies. When we return things from functions, we get copies. Right? They are at least semantically uh, at different locations in different stack frames. Uh, even for class types, this is true. So here I have a struct s containing an integer member m. Uh, this is a trivial class type. Um, and I'm putting one of those on the stack in f, and I'm returning it. Uh, and when I return it, uh, it we get a copy of that struct in j, inside test. Uh, and that return value is still passed in a machine register when possible, which in this case it is. Uh, that, that s will be passed back uh, in EAX. Um, so what about when s is too big to fit in a register? If it's too big for a machine register, here it is 3 ints worth of stuff, um, which I believe is too big. I think I checked that. Um, if not, make that five. Um, so here I create one of them uh, in f stack frame. So here is f on my stack here. I'm, I'm growing my stack uh, upward uh, on the screen. Even It grows downward in memory. But uh, um, So here I have f. Uh, we have uh, the variable i in f's stack frame. And when we re say return i here, um, x86-64 is calling convention, and, and most calling conventions for other architectures as well, say that the way you return large objects is that the caller should pass an extra hidden parameter pointing to space in the caller's own stack frame big enough to hold the result. Uh, this is known as the return slot. Um, so here in test's stack frame, test has a local variable j, and test also has enough space to hold the result of the f it's going to call. Tef test knows it's going to call f, so it creates space for f's return value and passes a hidden pointer um, to f. Um, now, the, the explanation I'm giving you right now, of course, is the baseline um, 
sort of without any optimizations, without any of the C plus plus seventeen changes, right? No, no tricks. Don't worry, the tricks are coming, but we're not there yet. Um, so inside F, F creates I, uh, and then at the return line, it copies I into the return slot. It knows where the return slot is because test passed that address to F as a hidden parameter, typically in the RDI register. Um, and then inside test, we get the result of F, and we do copy initialization and move it into the uh, uh, variable J. Now that was without any optimizations at all, right? Let's do it again faster. This step in particular is slow. Test can do better. Since test controls the allocation of both J and the return slot, right? These are both in, under the control of the, the code that is generated for test. It doesn't matter what F does. Test is, is allocating both J and the return slot. And test knows that the return slot will be used to copy initialize J. So test can allocate them both at the same memory address and avoid having to do the copy. So test now has half the stack space. It, its stack frame is only half as big because its local variable j is also the return slot. Um, and again, uh, f creates i in its own stack frame. At the return, it copies i into the uh, return slot, uh, which ha also happens to be j. And then it returns, and we're done, right? because the return slot is also j, so j already has the correct value. And notice that the optimizer can do this optimization all by itself under the as-if rule, right? The code, the code behaves exactly as if the optimization hadn't happened. The optimization is not observable by uh, the semantics of the C++ program because uh, s is still a trivial type, right? I have not yet introduced the idea that the special member functions could be doing something. Right? There's no user visible, user visible side effects here. We have no user-defined copy constructor, move constructor, destructor, anything like that. So this is completely invisible, and any good compiler is going to do this. In fact, uh, if we give the copy visible side effects, guess what? We can still do this optimization. So the C++ 98 standard has a special case in it that permits us to elide even a user-defined constructor call like this, uh, when initializing an object with a temporary of the same type. So this uh, f paren paren here is an expression that sort of evaluates to a temporary, at least it did in C++ 98, uh, and then when we copy that, tempor that temporary object into J, uh, C++ 98 said, you know what, you can elide the call to the copy constructor and just actually do this, you know, exactly this thing, put the return slot and J at the same location in memory so that that copy does not happen. But wait, there's more. C++17 made this even better. So C++17 changed the high-level formal semantics of PR value expressions like f paren paren. So in C++14 and earlier, between 98 and 14, f eagerly evaluated into a temporary object that had to be moved into j. Right? It, it was... Uh, what today we would call an x value, although we didn't call it that back then. Um, it was a, an object in its own right, and it had to be moved or copied into J, um, unless you were able to do copy elision. Copy elision was permitted by that special case that's been around since C++ 98. Now in C++ 17, we changed things. In C++ 17, a PR value is more like a recipe for initializing an object. You can think of a PR value as a recipe. Um, so here, when I say f paren paren, that's not really identifying a materialized object in memory that I have to then put somewhere else. What that is, is saying, here are instructions for creating an s. Which s do I want to create? j. So I create j using this, these instructions. Um, so that, that's a different way of thinking about it. It's different formal semantics. Uh, it corresponds to the exact same machine code um, that we've already been looking at, right, where the return slot is also j. This is now known as the result object of the function call, of, of the expression f paren paren. All right, so that also leaves one more step um, where we're moving data around physically in memory um, from i into the return slot. This step is slow, and this time f can do better. 
So f controls the allocation of i. i is in the stack frame of f. Um, so f gets to choose where i goes. And f also got a pointer to the return slot. f knows where the return slot is, and f knows that i is going to be used to initialize the return slot. So f can allocate i in the return slot, and then it doesn't have to do that copy when it returns. So let's run through that. That's real quick. Right? Here's test. It allocates its stack frame as usual and passes f a pointer to the return slot in which f will construct its result. That is to say, in which the result object of f will be materialized. Um, so this is what test stack frame looks like. It's got j, which also happens to be the return slot, and it's going to pass this pointer into f. Oops, sorry, I went the wrong way there. Into f. And now f is just going to construct i right there in the return slot. So that when we do the return, we don't need to do anything. i is already located in the return slot. This return statement corresponds to no machine code at all. Um, and this optimization is done automatically. Uh, in this case, uh, right? Not quite right. Uh, sorry, this is not done automatically under the as if rule because this time we have a move constructor that would ordinarily have to be called here. But um, C98 permits the compiler to elide it uh, as a special case. And notice here uh, that this was not affected by the C17 rules changes. The C17 changes to PR values affected the initialization of J uh, from the return object, from the result object. Um, but they did not affect return i, because i here is not a PR value expression. It's an L value, right? It's a named variable, so it's an L value. Um, so this is still copy elision. This is not something that you get for free in 17. This is something that requires a special case in the standard to say you can still do copy elision here. All right, so many things have to go right for this optimization to kick in. And by the way, I've been calling it copy elision out loud, but you've noticed the title of these slides. I've been calling it the named return value optimization. The named return value here is i. i is the name of the object that we're eventually going to return. Um, and we're allowed to to do it in, in that case. Here's when we're allowed to do it. Number one, there has to be a return slot. Um, so if your type, if your return type is trivial and it's going to get passed back in a register, uh, obviously copy elision is not going to kick in. Um, types with non-trivial special member functions, though, are always going to be returned via this whole hidden parameter return slot business. Um, secondly, uh, this return variable, um, you know, the, the named return value that that thing, i, needs to be under the control of f. f needs to be the one responsible for allocating it um, because the whole point is that we're going to allocate it into the return slot. Um, and also, it must have the exact same type. You know, maybe const qualified, but it has to have basically the same type as the return slot. So again, we can allocate it into the return slot because um, otherwise it won't fit. We're going to see examples on the next slide. And there's one more uh, restriction, one more constraint here, which is mental, not physical. Um, the return operand must be exactly an ID expression, such as i or x. I said we weren't going to talk about return more complicated expressions. Um, return x is special. If you say return and then just the name of a variable, maybe with some parentheses around it, that gets you the copy elision optimization. It does not uh, kick in for uh, more complicated expressions, like if I said... Um, I don't know, std move of i, for example, we're going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, and basically the reason for that is that if you uh, were to allow it in other contexts, uh, that would just get confusing. Um, so it's a special case for specifically return x. And of course, this whole talk is going to explain how that was a little bit of an oversimplification. So here are some examples of when NRVO does not happen. Um, so here, let's see, number one, f f returns uh, a, a object of type trivial, and trivial fits in a register and uh, is, in fact, trivial. Trivial for the purposes of calls is what uh, the calling convention calls it. And so here we have no return slot at all, so uh, we're not going to have this whole business about sharing addresses with things. right? We have x in our stack frame. We return it by copy in a register, and it comes out the other side, out of that register into our caller stack frame. No copy elision. Um, here, I'm returning a global variable. I said return x, but this x is already existing uh, somewhere 
not in my stack frame, you know, elsewhere. I don't control its allocation, so there's a, there's not going to be a way that I can allocate it into the return slot. I'm going to have to take it from where it actually is and, and copy it into the return slot. Uh, same deal here. This is a little subtler. It is a local variable, but again, it's static, which is like a glorified global variable. Um, so again, I have to take it from where it is and make a copy of it into the return slot. Um, also, even more subtly, in G3, um, with G3, we have um, a parameter of type S. And the parameter of type S um, is allocated by our caller. They put it, they push it on the stack or whatever, um, and then uh, they expect the return, the return object, the return slot, to be somewhere else. They say, here's your parameter, and here's where I want the result. We didn't control the allocation of either of those things, and so we cannot make them alias. Um, so same deal for all G1, G2, and G3. We don't control where X is allocated in any of those cases. Um, and then finally, with H, um, here, D is a class type that inherits from S, um, but it's bigger. Uh, and so D is too big to fit in the return slot. We cannot make X allocate into the return slot because uh, X is too big to fit. We're going to have to put it separately on the stack and then just copy the, the appropriate parts uh, when we do the return. All right. Moving a little bit forward in time, uh, just a couple more slides before the first question break. Introducing move semantics. C11 added move constructors, and in particular, it added move only types like unique putter. And this is a problem for NRVO because I want to be able to write a function uh, f that returns unique putter. And I'm going to create a local variable called x of type unique putter, and I'm going to say return x. Um, this does not compile. Right, or it didn't compile at the in proto C OX, right? It didn't compile because X was an L value, not an R value. It's a named variable, it's got a name, it can appear on the left hand side of an equal sign, it's an L value. Um, and unique putter is move only, so you cannot actually construct a unique putter from an L value unique putter, right? Only from an R value. Um, so to make it an R value, we would have to say return std move of X turned into an R value so that we could then move construct into the return slot. But when we do that, um, remember NRVO works only on a very simple return X. So that was probably pessimizing our code. It made it so the compiler could not use NRVO. Um, so this was going to be a problem. So during the C11 um, release cycle, they looked at this problem and they said, OK, well, when we see return X, even though x is an L value, we're going to do a special preliminary overload resolution, and we're going to look specifically for move constructors. And if we find one, then we're going to say, OK, this return x is well formed, even though normally it wouldn't be, because you're trying to uh, move out of an L value. But in this case, we will say OK. Uh, and the reason we're doing this is so that we allow people to write just return x. And the reason we want them to write just return x is so that they can get NRVO, they can get copy elision. Right? If they wrote something more complicated, that wouldn't a priori be a bad thing, but it would turn off this optimization that's super useful, and we want to leave the path open for them to get that optimization. So in the C11 standard, uh, there's some there's some verbiage here. We're going to see this over and over in the next sections. Overload resolution to select the constructor for the copy is first performed as if the object were designated by an R value. And if overload resolution fails, um, or the type of the first parameter, the selected constructor is not there, how you reference the object's type. So it's basically saying we're looking for move constructors. Overload resolution is performed again, considering the object as an L value. So um, here are some examples of, of why that wording was incorporated into 11. Um, so first, we do the overload resolution as if the object were designated by an R value. Um, that might fail. In particular, in C98, we had this thing called auto putter, which was terrible. But you know, we had it, Boost had it, some other people had it. Um, and it had a constructor that was sort of a copy constructor, but only from non-const L values. Right? It didn't have a regular copy constructor. It was uh, it, it would construct from auto putter ref. And so uh, here, when you say return x, we're gonna first look up and say, 
uh, could we make a copy of this if x were an r value? And the answer is no. That overload resolution finds no candidates that will accept an r value. The only candidate accepts l values only. Um, and so that overload resolution fails. And then we fall back to overload resolution is performed again considering the object as an l value. And we find this constructor and, and everything works just like it did in 98. Um, so we preserve compatibility with auto putter. If the type of the first parameter of the selected constructor is not an R value reference to the object's type, that is in there, uh, as far as I know, to deal with cases like this. Uh, it affects cases like this, at least. This is a, I'm calling it an auto share putter. I don't know any types that work this way, but I could imagine that someone had one back in the 90s. Um, I'm calling this auto share putter, and it has the same auto putter constructor that's sort of a fast pilfering pseudo copy constructor. Uh, and then um, if you have a const auto share putter and you try to make a copy of it, okay, we'll do that, but it's going to be slow. You know, however that works. Um, so in C++ 98, this return X would use the fast move constructor because X is a non-const L value. So we'll look at X, it's a non-const L value. It's going to prefer this fast pilfering constructor. Uh, but in C++ 11, we're going to resolve as if x were an r value. So this candidate, the first candidate here, the fast pilfering candidate, doesn't work on r values, but the second one does. So overload resolution does succeed, and it finds that second uh, slow copy constructor. Um, but we didn't actually want to call that. Um, so we look at the type of the parameter. We see that it's not an r value reference to the object's type. It's an l value reference to the object's type. Um, and so we say, Never mind, I will fall back and, and again do the, the uh, overload resolution performed again, considering the object as an L value. Um, so that's why those two things were in there when C11 was introduced. Um, shortly after 11 was released, there was a defect report. Uh, Core Working Group issue 1579 broadened this rule very slightly so that implicit move is going to apply even in cases where copy elision was not relevant, um, right? We were, the whole reason we were wanting people to write return X is to preserve the ability to do copy elision. Um, so it originally only applied in cases where copy elision applied. Um, but then people looked at these two cases. Uh, here we have a function G3 that takes a unique putter as a parameter and then returns it. Um, and copy elision, as we know, is not possible here because parameters are caller allocated. Um, but, um, okay, this CWG1579 says, yes, this is okay, you can do this, this does implicit move. Uh, and then H2 here, uh, we have a local variable, but it's of a different type. It's not of the type of the return slot, so X cannot be physically aliased with the return slot. Um, but there is an implicit conversion from unique putter of derived to unique putter of base, right? And in H2, we do that overload resolution, treating X as an R value. We find um, the templated constructor uh, with U equals derived here. And so this return X is well-formed because uh, the first overload resolution does find a constructor uh, whose uh, parameter is an R value reference to X's type. All right, so all local objects of automatic storage duration, regardless of type, get implicit move starting with the resolution of this defect in C++11. Now we're caught up to C++11, and nothing really changed until C++, you know, through 14 and through 17, until C++20, so we're going to talk about that next. But I'm going to switch back to the comments and see all of the chatter. There's all, all sorts of stuff. All right, what do we got? Um... We'll look at the Q and A first. Um, so, is uh, return x better than return x plus one? Um, it depends. Um, I think is the short answer. Notice that if you say x plus one, x plus one is a PR value, right? It's um, it's not an L value and it's not an X value. It's a PR value. It's a recipe for creating an object. And so, return x plus one was affected by the C++ 17 changes to the PR value semantics, sometimes known as guaranteed copy elision or deferred PR value materialization. Um, so um, 
yeah, it depends. Um, all right. I am going to proceed. So the CWG-1579 model, the resolution of that defect report, um, broadened the scope of implicit move greatly. And then people started using it. And we used it for nine years. And we discovered that there were some holes in it. Here are three of them. Um, so in this case, we have uh, a, this is the, the H2 that I showed on the previous slide right before the break. We have uh, return X. That gets implicit move uh, because the first overload resolution, um, remember, you're doing this thing with two overload resolutions. We're doing one overload resolution, treating X as an R value. And then only if that fails, do we do one treating X as an L value. So here, the first overload resolution finds the uh, move constructor. Um, it's not really a move constructor. It's a constructor of unique putter of base, but it's from the correct type, unique putter of derived ref ref. Um, and so it succeeds. In C++ uh, 11, 14, 17, the above code works fine. But if you remove the unique putters and you just say, I have a derived object and I am going to return a base, I'm going to slice it, in other words, slice it down to its base, um, well, copy elision isn't on the table. Um, we do the first overload resolution, treating X as an R value of type derived, and we find uh, we're trying to make a base out of it, but the base move constructor's signature takes a base ref ref, not a derived ref ref. So it does not take an R value reference to X's type, and so implicit move does not happen, and we silently get a copy. right? And this will be well-formed, assuming base is copyable, um, but it's not going to return by move. It's going to return by actual copy construct, and that can be arbitrarily slow if base has a bunch of you know strings and vectors and stuff as members. Um, so that's not so great. And the reason there is, is that we said the selected constructor is not an R value reference to the object type, right? Not any R value reference, but or to one of its bases, but specifically to its most derived type. So not so great. Um, we also said it had to be an R-value reference. This means that if you have uh, this example here, I've got um, sync, which is constructible from source. Um, but it takes a source as a, um, as a copy, right? As a PR value, essentially. It, it says, I take a copy of a source. I don't care where you get it from. Um, you might get it from copying some other source object. You might get it from moving from some other source object. I don't care. Just give me a source. Uh, that's all I need. Um, and so if I create a source on my stack frame and I say return that source, it should be implicitly converted to a sync. How do we do that implicit conversion? Well, we do first the overload resolution treating X as an R value, and we find that that would work fine for sync friends source. Um, but uh, the parameter source, that's not source ref ref. That's not an R value reference to source. And so uh, the first parameter of the selected constructor is not an R value reference. Therefore, overload resolution is performed again, considering the object is an L value, and we make a copy, right? This is silently copying X when we really expected it to be implicitly moved. And in G's case, uh, P is not a movable type at all, uh, and therefore this is just ill formed in C17. If you want to make it well formed, you stick a std move around here. And if you want to make f uh, efficient, you stick a std move around the x. And that's really ugly. We really don't want to train people to write return std move of things because that disables copy elision, the NRVO that we started with. So this is unfortunate. And finally, um, the uh, the wording says specifically constructor. It says overload resolution has to find a constructor. So if overload resolution for that implicit conversion operation finds something that's not a constructor, such as a conversion function, uh, then again, that's basically the same as if it failed. So here I have struct from with two conversion operators. One um, that can that is R value ref qualified and it can do something really fast. The other one is const ref qualified and it's maybe a little bit slower. Has to make some copies of things internally. Um, and I make one of these from objects on my stack and I return it and I am expecting to get implicit move. But in fact, in C plus plus seventeen, I get a copy. Right? It calls the uh, the sort of copy conversion operator. Um, 
And this seems very contrived. I know people don't use conversion operators very much in practice, but actually I saw this in real life, semi-real life, uh, in uh, one of the SG14 uh, GitHub repos. Um, we, we tried to use conversion operators instead of converting constructors, and uh, things got slow. And it was like, why? And we figured it out. Um, who knew? So I put in this paper for C++20, and if you've seen previous versions of this talk, um, they were all, I believe, before the adoption of that paper, pushing for that uh, paper to get in. Um, and these examples are, are also from the paper. And that paper was nothing but deletions. It just took this paragraph and it just crossed out all of that stuff that was getting in the way um, and uh, everything that works. So in C++20, um, you will correctly get a move from X in this first F. You will correctly get a move from the source in the second F. And you will correctly get the R value ref qualified uh, conversion operator in that last version of F. C++20 says done and done. We're going to do an overload resolution as if the object were designated by an R value. And that overload resolution might fail. But if it succeeds at all, awesome. We're done. Right? We're going to take that. No more comparing parameters or constructors or R value references. We're, we're just going to take whatever that resolution gives us. And in fact, it deleted even a little tiny bit more in text we haven't even seen because implicit move doesn't just apply to return. It applies to any situation where the compiler can tell that this is the last use of the object before leaving the function. It applies to function exiting uh, syntactic constructs. Right? It's purely local reasoning. We're not doing data flow analysis or anything. There have been proposals to do that. Herb Sutter had a talk at the last CppCon um, about like really going all the way toward Rust. Um, but this is purely lexically when you say return x or throw x, because that leaves the function. Or in C++20, co-return x is a way of, of leaving and not coming back. So we know that's the last use of x, and we know it's safe to move from it. And so we do implicitly move from it in those contexts as well. Um, and so there was just a little bit of wording uh, in here to, to enable that specifically for function parameters. Um, but by the way, when I say that C++17 said you had to make a copy and C++20 says you don't have to make a copy, uh, that's talking about the paper standard. The actual compiler vendors already implemented random subsets of the behavior I was proposing, uh, either because their users wanted it uh, or simply because they got the rules wrong, right? Because the rules were so weird with so many of these little cases, right? It has to be a constructor. It has to take an R-value reference. And, and it's just hard to implement. Um, so... Last time I gave the talk in uh, June 2019, well, at some point when I, when I did the paper uh, in 2019, this was the state of the world. Um, the red boxes here, the ones that say move, are places where compilers were non-conforming. Uh, and the green boxes that say copy are where the compilers conformed to the C++17 standard as written. But of course, the red boxes are better. I would love to see all red here, right? Because these should all be moves. Uh, but different compilers did different things, some by accident, some on purpose. Um, and their conformance drifts randomly over time. And the preparation for this talk, actually like three days ago, I went to Godbolt and ran all these tests again. And I saw that, you know, I'll flip back and forth between these two slides here. Um, they're just kind of randomly drifting in C++17. Um, Right, because there's this trade-off between do we implement the standard as written, or do we implement like the good performant thing that people expect? So P1155 um, was essentially trying to make those be the same thing. Right, let's standardize the the good thing that people expect, and I think we kind of succeeded. If we look at C++20 mode now, as of three days ago on Godbolt, um, we see that G, uh, GCC11 is now totally in conformance with the P1155 rules. Um, and now all of those moves that had been red on the previous slide are green, right? This is now standard behavior in C++20. Um, Clang 12 hasn't quite caught up, but in trunk it actually already has. Um, and Visual Studio and ICC haven't really started trying to implement these rules yet. Um, so they're, they're the same as on the previous slide, but now all of the uh, red moves are green moves and all the green copies are red copies. It says now you need to go make these moves as well. All right, so we're getting more moves in more places. That was the title of P1155, was more implicit move. Um, 
But there's another big change that also came in in C++20. Uh, this one will surprise you if you have not seen it before. It may delight or shock you. Um, I was initially shocked, but I'm coming around to delighted. That's David Stone's paper, PO527, implicitly move from R value references in return statements. So step one, this factors out in just moving the wording around, this factors out the notion of an implicitly movable entity. Um, so an implicitly movable entity is a variable of automatic storage duration and, and not volatile. And, and um, then we can start replacing you know, some of these long, complicated repetitions with just saying, is an implicitly movable entity? Is an ID expression named an implicitly movable entity? Okay. And then the bombshell, right? An implicitly movable entity is a variable of automatic storage duration that is either a non-volatile object or an R-value reference to a non-volatile object type. Okay. Um, so that, you know, those four words mean that when we say return RR here, Normally, anything with a name is null value. So RR here is null value. Normally, we would copy out of it. We'd say that string referred to by RR, um, you know, copy it into the return slot. But in C++20, return RR uh, is returning by name an implicitly movable entity. This RR is a variable of, type, of R value reference type. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so that will also get implicit move. And we will now move from the string referred to by RR. Um, this gives us um, something that uh, for a couple of years now, I've, I've used the phrase forward, perfect backwarding uh, for this. And I got that from Ezra Chung, if I recall correctly. Um, the idea of perfect backwarding is the op opposite of perfect forwarding. Um, we want to call this function, and we want to return its um, result perfectly back to our caller, um, but maybe modifying it in some way along the way. So uh, I'm going to capture it in a decal type auto variable x, and then I can do whatever I want, you know, x dot modify in some way, and then return x. Um, so f of a here uh, initializes its, so f of a, a, a's foo returns a pr value a. So here, variable x is of type a, uh, and we return something of type a, and it all works great. Um, f of b, um, b's foo returns a b ref. So here, x is a b ref, uh, and here I am copy constructing from the thing referred to by that b ref into my result slot. Um, again, not a problem. Um, wait a minute, am I doing this right? Why is G different from F? Ah, yes, okay. Um, we are comparing F to G. So F is the, the version of, of returning uh, t.foo um, just directly, and then G is inserting that, that possible modification, right? Giving it a name and then returning it by name. Um, so F and G should have the same behavior. Um, and indeed, F of A and G of A have the same behavior. F of B and G of B have the same behavior f of c and g of c, where x here is an r value reference, um, well, in C++20, since x is a local variable of r value reference type, we will move out of it into the return slot. Uh, in C++17, we would not have. We would have copied um, from the thing referred to by x into the return slot. Um, and so C++20 has made g of c more efficient, and has made it match f of c. So f of c and g of c used to have different behavior. Now they have the same behavior. But there is a problem even in C++20. So now I've changed the return types from regular auto, so they're not just returning a, b, c. I've changed them to decal type auto. So we're going to return a, b ref, and c ref ref. Um, so for a and b, it all works pretty much the same. For c, f of c returns decal type auto, so uh, C's foo returns C ref ref. So this is going to return a C ref ref um, bound to the referent of T dot foo. So that works fine. Um, but then in G, it's going to declare a local variable X of type C ref ref, and then it's going to say return X 
um, where the decal type of X is crefref. So we're trying to return a crefref result from a crefref variable. And in C++ uh, 17, that didn't work because X is an L value and you cannot bind an R value reference to an L value uh, without an explicit std move. So this was ill-formed. And in C++ 20, this remains ill-formed. The reason is that implicit move applies only to objects, right? In the following copy initialization contexts, like return from a function with a class return type. Uh, and we're looking specifically for how to do overload resolution on the constructor for the copy. Here, we're not making a copy. We're just binding a reference. We're not going to construct any objects. We're just binding a reference. Um, so none of the implicit wording, none of the implicit move wording kicked in at all. And uh, that remained true even after P1155 and even after P0527 were both applied because they were just modifying the rules of implicit move. Uh, they weren't changing the, the overall, um, you know, when do we apply this? So in C++20, we have this unfortunate situation where um, if I take a move-only refref parameter, I can then return it by name if I am, in fact, making a copy, if I am, in fact... Uh, moving from the thing referred to by RR. But if I just want to return a move only ref ref directly, I cannot just pass it through. This is ill formed because RR is an L value. Uh, so this is still the case in C20, and uh, this seems unfortunate. And now we're caught up to C20, and I'm going to try to flip back and see if we have more questions. Everyone's eyes have glazed over already. All right. Oh, one Q&A. Um, with all the pitfalls, is there a good way to get warnings or errors when an implicit move doesn't kick in? Uh, Clang, for the past couple of years, has had a warning uh, uh, called, I think, uh, returns did move um, that will diagnose places where uh, P1155 fixed the problem. Um, essentially, uh, I made that warning in Clang. Um, and then I said, this is dumb. Let's just make a paper instead and fix it. Um, so now that warning is almost counterproductive because it's like, just upgrade to C++20 and then all your problems go away. Um, so it was kind of wasted effort. I don't know. Um, but also in other compilers, I don't believe they have any sort of uh, warning for this. Um, and uh, Jason says, is there work on fixing that? Presumably you mean these whole, the hole that I have just identified in the slides. Yes, in fact, that is the subject of our next um, little bit. Um, is it possible to solve the issue with the decal type auto return by saying return std forward of t of foo? Um, yes, that will do the right thing, but you won't get copy elision. You're not going to get NRVO if you say return anything other than a simple name. So you're losing copy elision. You're getting the right copy and move. Um, you know, you're copying when it should copy and it's moving when it should move, but it's moving in one case where we would like to get an RVO instead. Um, so that's why we don't want to say return did move of foo or return did forward of foo. How much performance are we losing if we lose on RVO? Um, well, uh, as Howard Hinnant liked to say of move semantics in general, it's, it's an infinite optimization, right? Because you are removing one move construct. How expensive is your move constructor? Well, it depends on what it does, and what it does is user-defined, and it might recursively call other things, and so it is infinitely useful to just not run that code. All right. Um, let us continue. And let's go down another little rabbit hole here, because this is a fun story that I did not know before I started work on P2266, and that is the dangling reference wrapper. So here's a bit of code. This is C++ 98 code. It looks really simple. Um, I'm showing you down here, uh, by the way, this is the standard reference wrapper, all the bits of it we care about, which is literally just what's its constructor overload set. And in C++ 98, it had basically one constructor. Reference wrapper of T was constructible from a reference to a T. Um, so here I have a function f that creates a local variable x and then says return x, and its return type is reference wrapper of int. So what happens? Um, well, we try to construct a reference wrapper of int from x. x is an L value. Reference wrapper has a 
uh, tref constructor. Of course, this compiles and it returns a, a reference wrapper referring to X, which is now gone, and you have a dangling reference wrapper. Right. So this code is perfectly valid C++. You can compile it. It will just have undefined behavior if you try to use that dangling reference wrapper at runtime. So this is this is a pitfall. We don't really want this to compile, but it does, and it makes perfect sense why it does. Not a problem. So then C++ 11, uh, same thing, right? Prior to uh, CWG 1579, we would do those two lookups. Um, and uh, Oh, sorry, prior to C CWG 1579. So X here uh, is not implicit moved at all, right? It's an int. This is a reference wrapper event. Those are different types. Um, so we're not even going to... We're not going to do the uh, the implicit move stuff at all. But then CWG 1579 came along. And then X becomes a candidate for implicit move because it is a, an object on F stack. It is an automatic storage object. Um, and so we're going to do that first lookup, looking for um, reference wrapper, a way to construct a reference wrapper of int from an int ref ref. Uh, and that's going to find this uh, deleted constructor. So that overload resolution, this is subtle, that overload resolution succeeded, but the candidate that it found was deleted. And so um, the first overload resolution is successful. We don't do the second overload resolution. We say, ah, oh, yes, I am going to use this deleted constructor. Um, and of course, if you try to use the deleted constructor, uh, you get an ill-formed program. So return X is now ill-formed. Um, that's great. We didn't really want this code to compile in the first place. Return X was ill-formed. But then um, there was a problem, a separate problem that was discovered uh, with reference wrapper. Um, I think uh, Stefan Lobowade, I, I think, filed the, the issue about this. The problem with C++11 reference wrapper was that deleted functions um, are still visible to overload resolution, as we saw on the previous slide. But there are contexts in which we don't want that. We wanted to actually sphene away. I came up with a sort of contrived example for the purposes of these slides. Um, I say uh, make unique of derived, and I have a, an R value, unique putter to derived, and I have two candidate functions G, one of which takes a reference wrapper to unique putter of derived, so it wants the L value, and the other one takes a unique putter to base. Um, so it would have to do a conversion as well. So these both have to do conversions, uh, but only one of them is actually going to work. Right? You can't take a reference wrapper to an R value, but you can take one to an, to an L value. Um, and we're giving an R value, right. Um, and the problem is this was ambiguous because both overload resolutions succeed. Uh, both of these candidates are viable. It's just that one of them uses a deleted function and the other one doesn't. Uh, but the overload resolution as a total for G is ambiguous. So there was a, an issue filed for reference wrapper about this. And they said, okay, uh, we are going to make this Sphene friendly. We're going to get rid of that deleted overload. And we're just going to use some Sphene here to make sure that reference wrapper, uh, that the constructor works only for things that are convertible to tref, but not convertible to tref ref. You know, words to that effect. Very complicated Sphene test here. Um, and now we have gone back to our original behavior of f. Um, so the first overload resolution finds no candidates because the constructor templates Sphene is away. So then we do the second overload resolution, treating X as an L value. Uh, that succeeds, and we return a dangling reference wrapper. So that's the situation um, in you know, 17 and 20. Um, but, um, right. Uh, I said it was subtle that deleted functions are still visible to overload resolution. If our first uh, overload resolution finds a deleted function, um, should that count as failure or should that count as success? Right? It, it's not. Uh, it is entirely clear from the wording of the standard that no, like that is totally a success. But you know, in human colloquial terms, mm, I can totally understand someone misunderstanding that. Um, so if the best best match is deleted, uh, is that a failure? Um, and uh, even worse, if overload resolution is ambiguous, is that a failure? So in this case, I have uh, three structs, left, right, and both. Both inherits from left and right. And I have this ambig struct, uh, which is constructible from R values of type left and right, or L values of type both. And I'm passing it a both. I say return x. We do an overload resolution treating x as an R value. 
that finds two candidates, left ref ref and right ref ref. Uh, so it's ambiguous. If the first overload resolution fails or was not performed, overload resolution is performed again and will, of course, find ambig of both ref, and it will use that. But is an ambiguity a failure? Or is an ambiguity a success that means uh, your program is ill-formed, right? Um, again, I can totally understand someone misinterpreting the, the wording of the standard there. Um, and there's another thing, as long as we're talking about reference wrapper, uh, implicit move applies only to objects. And so the gains that we made in P15 uh, or 1155 are distributed inequitably. Reference wrapper event benefits from uh, those changes that, that came in in C20, but uh, int ref itself does not. So here um, I have Larry, Curly, and Shemp. They all have conversion operators. One, Larry has conversion operators to reference wrapper. Curly has conversion operators to literally reference to int. Uh, Larry gets move semantics here. It calls the ref qualified version of the operator. Curly and Shemp do not get um, uh, move semantics here because uh, the uh, implicit move rules that P1155 changed uh, are specifically for functions returning objects of class type and int ref and int star are not objects of class type. And so we don't do any of the implicit move stuff. Um, and so these are calling the const ref qualified versions uh, of the operators. All right, so yeah, the, uh, we had the, the Larry returns a class type and so it gets implicit move. Curly and Shemp, these F2 and F3 return non-class types. They don't get implicit move. Uh, that's kind of surprising. Um, and again, we have a little bit of implementation divergence here. Uh, the green stuff is conformance to C++20. The red stuff is non-conformance. Um, and uh, actually, ICC is the only one that gets the ambiguous case right. Uh, my interpretation of that result is that uh, you know everyone knows about the other, the first case, uh, because of the LWG issue, um, but the the ambiguous case not so much. So implicit move is still confusing. Doing two overload resolutions is confusing for vendors. Um, and uh, restricting implicit move also to class type copy initialization context is confusing um, because we have this surprising contrast between the reference wrappers and native references. Um, and you know, speaking of reference wrapper, why is this you know, return a reference wrapper to X? Why is this even well-formed in the first place? Uh, we would actually prefer this to be ill-formed if we can figure out some rules to, to make it so. Um, by the way, quick sidebar on coroutines and related topics. Uh, C++20 expanded implicit move to work on co-return as well as regular return. And as far as I can tell, C++20 doesn't actually limit the co-return co -return case to class types. Um, so if I have a, um, a coroutine F2 that returns, you know, task of int, and I try to co-return a curly, um, that should actually be calling the, that, that does get the implicit move wording, and that will uh, call the R value ref qualified version of the operator. Um, so uh, it looks like people are generally conforming to that, I think. Um, so what's the difference? Uh, the difference is whether it is a an int or a curly, and it turns out people are actually better with the curlies than the ints. Interesting. I don't know. Um, but most people have not implemented uh, coroutines yet, and those who have haven't also implemented P1155. So uh, I don't expect that this, this is uh, long-term behavior here. This is just a snapshot of, of where people are in their C++20 uh, implementation at the moment. But what about co-yield? Um, someone who knows about implicit move might think it should also work for co-yield, right? Here I have some generator, and the generator allows me to yield either an L value or an R value, and presumably the yield value of an R value is going to be faster, right? I get the move out of the thing into my promise, wherever it is that I'm moving the, the contents. Um, and so couldn't we do an implicit move here? Couldn't we move from the, the X here? The S should say X. Um, and the problem is, uh, no, a coroutine is not exactly like a function. When we return a value from a function, 
the function stack frame goes away, so we know the return is the last use of x. When we co-yield from a coroutine, uh, we are sort of returning a value, we're yielding a value, but the activation frame of the coroutine does not go away. That goes away only at the end when you finally do the co-return. Uh, and so the co-yield, we are sort of yielding the value of x, but we don't want to move out of it because when you resume this coroutine, you might want to use x again. And from, we can sell in that case, there was just a curly brace at the end, so we, the human, knew that x was not going to be reused. But the compiler, using purely local reasoning, uh, doesn't know that maybe the value of x is important, so I want to preserve it, so I want to make a copy of it. So if you're co-yielding things... Um, using some sort of task or generator or something that, that uh, where move semantics matters, you would want to say co-yields did move of x. Um, however, I, I don't know enough about coroutines and, and the usual library types to say that you should do that in practice. There are certainly generators where co-yielding x doesn't actually move x anywhere, right? I mean, you've got the coroutine suspended, x is in its frame, the generator actually only needs to have a, a reference to the x, and give that to someone else. You don't actually need to, to pull it out anywhere. So uh, move semantics may not be important for uh, co-yield. I'm not sure. What else is like uh, a coroutine, where things are not stored directly in the stack frame of this function, but they're pulled out somewhere else? Where? Well, it's a lot like a member function, right? When you return from a member function, and I'm returning x, can I move from x? I mean, I'm returning it from a function. Should I be able to move out of it? No, because it's not on my stack frame. It's inside the data members of, uh, of foo. The foo instance's member data does not go away just because you returned from one of its member functions. Um, not even if the member function has a suggestive name like retrieve my result. Right? The compiler cannot prove this is the last use of x. Um, and for this reason, returns did move of x is never going to be entirely obsolete. Right? We are expanding the places where you can just say return x um, as if this were a simple language like Python, um, and we're expanding the number of cases where that just works. But uh, it's never going to always just work. If you really wanted to move out of X in this case, you would have to say returns did move of X. And the compiler is not going to even be able to, to you know, warn you that, hey, maybe you want to move out of X here. Right? It has no idea. It's not looking at the name of this function and seeing, hmm, yes, this is probably the last use of x. That doesn't happen. So what else is like member functions? Uh, lambdas, right? A lambda is just a class with member functions in disguise. Um, so this lambda that says return y, can it move out of y? No, because you might call the lambda a second time, right? This is just like our very first Kant NRVO example. Um, we don't control the allocation of either x or y. And so we can't enter VO, um, and we don't control the lifetime of X or Y. We don't know that this is the last use of X. We don't know that this is the last use of Y. So I'm, I'm subtly distinguishing here between controlling the allocation, which allows us to do copy elision, and controlling merely the lifetime of it so that we know this is the last use of it and we can move out of it. Um, but in both cases, X and Y here, we don't control their allocation or their lifetime. And so we cannot even implicit move. If you wanted an explicit move, return std move of y, you could do that. The compiler is not going to do it for you. And there's one more noteworthy case, as long as we're talking about exceptions again. Structured bindings. A structured binding is a thing with data members in disguise. All right, when I say return x here, x is not a variable of blah, blah, blah type. x is syntactic sugar. It's a binding that means roughly the same thing as my hidden variable dot x, like the x field, right, dot first. Um, it is not a local variable. Implicit move does not apply to it. It is not an implicitly movable entity, right, because it's really some hidden pair dot first. So this, so return x when x is a structured binding, no implicit move. And then there's this. Um, so uh, here, x is not even an object. It's a uh, t ref ref, and I'm saying return x uh, to create a t. Is this going to move out of the thing referred to by x, or is it going to copy out of the thing referred to by x? Well, x is still not a variable, so implicit move uh, still does not apply. Uh, so we are going to make a copy. 
Uh, every compiler gets that right except GCC. GCC will move in this case. Um, so C++ 20 rules, very much improved. We saw more green on the table earlier, but you know, still some awkward cases. And sidebar return to topic at hand, doing these two overload resolutions is confusing. Uh, restricting the implicit move to class types is confusing. And why is this even well formed? I'm about to present a solution, P2266, that I've mentioned a couple of times here. Um, but do we have any questions so far? Those technical difficulties really dampened the chat. All right, I'm going to continue. All right, so there is another paper. Um, P1155 was more implicit move. P2266 is simpler implicit move. Um, so doing two overload resolutions was confusing. It confused the vendors, um, and it confuses programmers. It, it's weird. So let's just stop doing it. Programmers have come to expect implicit move over the past decade. Programmers have caught up to move semantics. Programmers no longer write autoputter style classes that depend on having these sort of pseudo copy constructors that take mutable L values. Um, so at the beginning of this talk, I explained why C++11 had all of those specific cases in there. Um, it was for backward compatibility with autoputter. Well, it's a decade later, people have stopped doing autoputter. We now can remove the fallback. Um, also, restricting implicit move to class type copy initialization was confusing. Um, we saw this as the reference wrapper versus interref problem. So we're going to uh, refactor. Class.copy or class.copy elision was never the appropriate place for this implicit move wording because it, it's not really about classes. It's about value categories. So it should go somewhere that applies uniformly to all types, both class types and primitive types and reference types and everything else. Um, Expert prim id unqual is actually the correct spot for this wording. So step one, we're going to move the wording over into the, the wording that talks about id expressions and what value category they have. Um, so um, an implicitly movable entity, we're not going to change any of this wording. Uh, but rather than saying in the following copy initialization contexts and then talking about returns and throws and, and so on, we're just going to say, in these contexts, an ID expression is move eligible if it is the operand of a return or a co-return, if it's the operand of a throw, um, with, with these, you know, all of this stuff cut and pasted from the other place. And then we say, an ID expression is an X value if it is move eligible. And it's an L value if the entity is a function, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, in this wording that talks about what is the value category of an ID expression, before ID expressions could only be L values or PR values in certain very rare cases. Now we're going to say they're L values, PR values, or if they're move eligible, if they name um, implicitly movable entities that satisfy all of these conditions and in the operand of a return or a throw, then they're X values. They're just treated like R values. And then we remove all that wording that we didn't take up. Um, so we don't talk about how we're going to first consider a move operation, then a copy operation. We're not going to talk about overload resolution. None of, none of that is going to happen anymore. All of that goes away. The ID expression is an X value. When you say return X, if X is move eligible, the expression X is an R value. Otherwise, it is an L value. And then we just do one overload resolution, and we see whether it succeeds or fails, and we're done. Um, so P2266's wording is intended to apply equally to primitive types and reference bindings, and it doesn't depend at all on the function return type or, or any of that other stuff. Essentially, we take those two overload resolutions and we just stop doing them. We do one. Um, so this uh, extends the saga of the dangling reference wrapper. After P226X, which is where I hope we will be in C23, um, when you say return X here, X here is an ID expression that identifies an implicitly movable entity and it is move eligible in this context. Therefore, it is an X value. Since it is an X value, when we do overload resolution, we find out that, oh, we actually cannot bind a reference wrapper to an X value, right? It requires an L value. And so this code does not compile and return X is ill-formed. Hooray, that's actually 
Nice. Right? Anyone who was writing this was writing bugs, so now we've just caught their bugs for them by making them ill-formed. Um, this does have some possibly surprising effects on pathological code, uh, even besides what we saw on the previous slide. Um, so here I have F, G, and H, and they're all returning references to uh, local variables. So these, all of these functions return dangling references of one type or another. Uh, up through C++20, F and G are both well-formed, and they return dangling references. H is ill-formed because X is an L value. But after P2266, uh, it changes. Now, f is ill-formed. You cannot return an int ref to a local variable anymore, at least not doing it like this, uh, because x here is going to be an x value. So this doesn't compile, but g and h now are well-formed. So all three are dangerous and silly. We're just shuffling around the ill-formedness of, the, of these functions, but nobody should be writing any of them. Um, now, autoputter uh, is... Uh, possibly a more serious case. So autoputter is constructed from an autoputter ref. We, we saw this before. And in C++11 through C++20, we tried really hard to keep this compiling. P2266 proposes that we break this code, the, this f that tries to return x where x is an autoputter. We're going to break that because now x is an r value, which does not bind to the l value reference in this constructor. Um, there are several ways people could have fixed this. I would hope that the way they fix it is stop using autoputter. Another way you could fix it is give autoputter a move constructor. If it, you know, you've had 10 years, give it a move constructor already. Um, and finally, uh, you can also modify f itself. Uh, you could say return autoputter of x or return, you know, and then you cast it explicitly to an L value reference. Uh, there are various things you can do to make this compile uh, by modifying the, the line return x. Because remember, this implicit move stuff only affects return x, return an identifier, not more complicated expressions. So here in return autoputter of x, what is the value category of x? It's an L value, because things with names are generally L values. The only time an ID expression is not an L value, when it's, a, when it's an x value, is when it's subject to implicit move, which only happens for return x. Uh, so that's why return autoputter of x doesn't have the problem that return x would. Uh, your auto share putter um, in 98 through 17, uh, this continued to be well formed. We continued calling the pilfering pseudo copy constructor instead of the real copy constructor. Uh, 1155 um, knowingly broke this, and it said if people are really writing code like this, um, where they have a pseudo copy constructor and then like a real copy constructor, um, and this is not a move constructor, right? Single ampersand. Then um, we don't really care. This is pathological code, uh, and their copy constructor and their pseudo copy constructor should really do the same thing, right? They both they're both taking the only difference is const. They should really do the same thing. So in C plus plus twenty, uh, when we do the overload resolution here, treating x as an R value, uh, we do find a candidate and we do use it. We do not do that second overload resolution treating x as a non-const uh, L value uh, that would have found the pilfering constructor. Um, so in 20, uh, if you want to preserve the behavior of this code, number one, you're doing C++ wrong, but uh, you can preserve the behavior of this code again by saying return auto share putter of x. Right? Take x using its current value category without any of the implicit move messings with value category. Take it take x as an L value and make an auto share putter out of it. So C++23 is not going to change the behavior of this code any further than it has already been changed by C++20. So revisiting our uh, perfect backwarding. Um, so this was our first example where we're returning a T uh, from F and from G. And in C++17, uh, when we did a return from an R value, um, from a C ref ref, um, that was making a copy construct. Here we're making a move construct. Um, so C plus plus twenty has made G of C a little bit better. Uh, and uh, P two two six six is going to make the decal type auto version work as well, uh, because now uh, when we say return X, well, uh, what is the decal type of X in in G of C? Right? So in GFC, x is a C ref ref, 
So decal type of X is CREFREF. Ref. Um, and so we're going to bind uh, X to that CREFREF. Ref. What is the value category of X? It's an L, or sorry, it's an X value after P2266. So P2266 makes this code work. Um, by the way, what if we put parentheses around this? Um, so decal type auto is a little bit confusing, um, but I think that it all hangs together um, in a self-consistent way. In all versions of C++, including the proposed C++23, decal type auto follows the same special case as decal type of expert. If you're decal typing an ID expression that names an entity, uh, we're going to use the declared type of that entity, like T. If you put parens around it, you say, what's the decal type of parens X here? Um, we're going to say, well, that has the value category of X. And so uh, up to C++20, uh, the value category of X here has been L value. Even though we're doing this weird overload resolution thing, you know, it, X is still an L value. But in C++23 with P2266 applied, the value category of X is actually X value. Um, so in C++23 with P2266 applied, we propose that the decal type auto return type of G should be uh, T ref ref, not just T. Um, and that sounds crazy when I put it that way, um, but notice how absolutely insane this code is, right? It, it's, uh, it's a decal type auto, and it's returning a parenthesized thing, and that was already uh, likely. You know, if you see this in your real code, this is probably a bug. Um, but then also the nice thing about this is that we'll just compile. Um, here's a big table, and for once, this is not a conformance table. This is uh, a bunch of functions that you could write, um, all of these being templated on T, right? Um, and whether the return statement is well-formed or ill-formed in each version of C++. Um, and uh, also what that return type is. So obviously, if it's just a plain old auto, um, or sorry, Yes, it plain, it's a it's a it's a decal type of X. What is the decal type of X? It's just T. What is the decal type of parens X? That's uh, T ref in each case. Um, and I have a typo on this slide that I should probably actually fix live. Um, the typo being that here this should have said uh, T ref, right? We, we're not changing the decal type of X. Um, however, we are making this ill-formed. Um, right, P2266 is saying, well, here, X is an R value. Right? We're doing implicit move from it. Um, and so you're trying to bind the implicit moved X to a TREF? No, I'm not going to let you do that. Um, all right, I will make sure when I upload the slides for this presentation that the table is, in fact, accurate. But I, I think that that was the only issue. We will see. Um, so P2266 went to the Evolution Working Group in uh, St. Patrick's Day 2021. Um, generally well accepted, general approval, um, targeting C++23, but uh, held up by the lack of implementation experience. Um, they said, you know, we're, we're making a big change. We want to see, A, it can be implemented, and B, what code does it break in real life? As we see, it's going to have some effects on weird auto-putter-ish things. Um, so Matthias Isvakov has been implementing P2266 uh, in Clang. There is a uh, patch review out. Um, I would like to see it get into the standard uh, C++ 2B mode in Clang so that people could actually be trying it uh, on real code bases. Um, I think that is extremely unlikely. Um, but anything anyone in the audience can do to help it along, try to get it into Clang, that would be great. Um, and if we can't get it into Clang, at least we can have people uh, patch Clang, uh, especially if you know any C++ now sponsors that have a type called managed putter. It would be really nice to know uh, how this patch Clang works uh, with their uh, managed putter. Oh, and that is pretty much it. Um, we went quickly through those tables because I thought we were going to run out of time, and we have about 15 minutes left for questions. Um, so let me switch back and see if there are questions. I see two in the Q&A tab. Um, 
Jason says, why is uh, Clang not claiming to implement P1155? Yes, it's because uh, the two papers that I mentioned in this talk, P1155 and P0527, um, they were accepted in an omnibus paper called P1825, uh, which combined their wordings. Notice they, they touched the same code, so they, they needed to sort of be merged before they could be uh, brought in. Um, what do I think of Herb Sutter's um, sort of rusty data flow um, proposal? Um, as far as I know, that's not a proposal. It's a talk or a talk series. Uh, I don't think there's a paper attached to it or anything. Uh, I think that it's uh, less far along than, than stuff like the uh, exception handling stuff that he's been doing. Um, so uh, I don't think there's even a paper. What do I think about it? Um, mm, hard to tell. Um, it, it's not very C++ y right? It, it's it's a decades long migration path to to get over to the to to where he is, um, and uh, maybe we can get there. Maybe we can't. Um, all right. Um, other questions. Uh, we'll stick around for another bunch of time. Uh, otherwise, I will see you all in uh, the uh, gather town after this. So I'll, I'll try to go to the room and answer some questions if there are any. Uh, just chat about stuff. Um, again, I do training. If you like this talk, uh, send me an email. Uh, I also have a blog. You know, it's me. All right. Thanks for coming.